Hi there. So today I want to tell you about a big circle of ideas, which pretty much just relies on basic complex analysis, at least for the, for the beginning part, that interconnects a, a large family of seemingly different objects, including things like elliptic curves over the complex numbers, complex tori, lattices, modular forms, and then, in, I mean, more modernly, uh, things like L functions, automorphic forms, automorphic representations, um, things like that. Actually, historically, where all this stuff started was things called elliptic integrals. So people were trying to calculate things like arc lengths of ellipses or lemniscates and things like that. So this goes back to the work of people like Abel and Jacobi and Gauss and Euler uh, in it around, the 18, around the 18th, 19th century. But what I want to talk about today is actually, first, the, the connection between complex tori and lattices um, and elliptic curves over the complex numbers. All right, so to do that, we're going to have to pass through the theory of elliptic functions. Now, historically, the theory of elliptic functions was started by Jacobi, and he did things, he did everything through theta functions. But it's actually a little, much more elegant to formulate things through Weierstrass's approach, which is through the so-called p-function, okay? So, I'm going to start off with a lattice in C, and I'm going to show you how you can construct a complex torus, and then I'm going to talk about how complex tori and elliptic curves over C are really the same thing, okay? So, let's say that I start off with a lattice lambda in C, right? So, what do I mean by a lattice? Well, I don't want it to be degenerate, so it better, it better have full rank in C. So lambda should look like the integral span of omega 1 and omega 2, where uh, omega 1 and omega 2 are two complex numbers which are independent over R, okay? So in other words, when you think about these things as vectors in R2, they're linearly independent, okay? So it's just the integral span of these two complex numbers with omega 1 and omega 2 linearly independent over the reals. So in other words, if I look at omega 2 over omega 1, so I take their quotient, then that's not real, okay? So we have this lattice, and now what I'm going to do? I'm going to take the complex numbers, so notice that this lattice is a discrete additive subgroup of, of the complex numbers. I can form the quotient group, C mod lambda, and this is an abelian group, of course. But it has more structure than just an abelian group. So C, the complex numbers, they're the fundamental example of a Riemann surface. In other words, a one-dimensional complex manifold. Okay? So if I take this quotient, not only do I get a group structure on the quotient, it also has geometric structure, which it inherits from the complex numbers. Okay? So this is an abelian group, and uh, a Riemann surface. Now, of course, because of the, because of the, since I've just taken a quotient, the addition operation on this group is very natural. Okay, it's just addition of cosets. So, now let me talk about elliptic curves. So, what's an elliptic curve over C? So, if, if, if you ask an algebraic geometer, they'll tell you it's a non-singular projective cubic. But for us, it's, it'll be good enough to define it like this. So an elliptic curve over C over C, what is that? It's just the set of all pairs of complex numbers, x, y, which satisfy an equation like this. Okay, so y squared is equal to, I'm going to put a 4 here, just for normalization purposes, so 4x cubed plus ax plus b. All right? So what am I saying here? You pick your two favorite complex numbers, a and b, okay? And then you write down this equation. And, of course, I want to assume that this cubic has distinct roots, okay? So it doesn't have any repeated roots. You write this equation down, and you look at all the pairs x, y in C2, okay, the two-dimensional vector space over C, that satisfy this equation. And this traces out what, what's called an elliptic curve. It's called an elliptic curve because 
from the perspective of algebraic geometry, it is really a one-dimensional object. Okay, the transcendence degree of its function field is one. But um, topologically, of course, is a surface. So it, it locally looks like a patch of the complex plane. Okay? So as I said before, A and B here, those are just constants. Okay, and I assume that the discriminant of this cubic is not, not zero. So I get a non-singular curve. Uh, if, if the discriminant is zero, then the curve ends up having singularities. So it could have a cusp or a node. Um, those are actually the only two possibilities for singularities. So that's what an elliptic curve over C is. So now let me talk about how you can add points on elliptic curves. So if you have such a thing, there's actually a way that given two points on the elliptic curve, you can obtain a third. And it's easiest to describe this geometrically, but once you've done so, you can write down algebraic equations, and then you can pick those equations up and use them over any field you want. And it turns out that no matter what, the f what field the elliptic curve is over, so you, you can take the cubic to have coefficients in any field you want. It could be a finite field or something crazy like the field of Laurent series um, or something like that. And once you form this elliptic curve, there's always this way that you can add points. So let's see how you do it geometrically, and I'll leave it to you to write down the formulas. That, that describe this if, if you want. So to describe it geometrically, let me just draw an elliptic curve over the reals, okay? So let's say that I just have y squared equals 4x cubed plus ax plus b, and I'm gonna plot all the points x, y in the real plane that satisfy this equation. So. I mean, there are different things you can get depending on whether this, this, uh, this cubic has all real roots or whether it only has one real root and the other two are complex. Um, so let's assume that it, it's this case. Oh, I'll draw that a bit better. Okay, so it looks like this. It's, act it's actually symmetric about the x-axis, okay? And the way you add two points on it, so let's say you have this point and this point, how do I add them together? Well, what I do is I just draw a straight line, and that, that straight line is going to intersect my curve somewhere else over here, say, okay? And then that's not the sum, you have to do something else to get it to, to play nicely. You have to reflect this point across the x-axis, okay? So you reflect him down here, so call this P and call this Q, then P plus Q is defined to be this point. All right. So if you define the addition on the, on the curve like this, it turns out that you don't quite get an abelian group uh, because you're missing the identity for the addition. You're missing the zero, so to speak. And the zero, where it comes from, is instead of thinking about this as an affine curve, I actually want to think about it as a projective curve, okay? So instead of looking at pairs x, y in C2, so that the affine plane over uh, C, or R in this case, I guess, what I actually do is I look at the projective plane, okay? So in the complex case, I would be looking at CP2, and I'd be thinking about, so I would convert this, I would homogenize this to give me uh, homogeneous polynomial, and then that would define a zero set in the complex projective plane. And then with that approach, now I do have the point at infinity, and when I define my addition this way, I can just say, oh, well, the point at infinity added to any other point is just zero. And that makes sense geometrically too, because if you think about the point at, I mean, if I, if I add a point P to the point at infinity, then I should draw a tangent line to P, okay? So it's gonna kind of intersect P. It's gonna intersect the elliptic curve twice at P. And then that way, the point infinity really does play the role of the zero. So it's an identity element for this group operation, okay? So anyway, what, that, what that's shown you now, especially in view of my comments uh, regarding the projective approach, is that now I'm gonna have a compact Riemann surface, okay? Which is also an abelian group. And it turns out that complex tori and elliptic curves over C are pretty much the same thing. So there's a correspondence.
All right, so I said that to get at this correspondence, I would have to pass through the theory of elliptic functions. These are also called doubly periodic functions. So you can probably guess what those are, but um, let me just define them. So if lambda, again, it's a lattice in C, then a meromorphic function uh, f from C into the extended complex plane, so I take C and I just throw in the point at infinity, so I'm working with the Riemann sphere here. This is called doubly periodic or elliptic with respect to lambda. or elliptic with respect to lambda if f of z plus omega is just f of z. And that's for all points in the domain z and all lattice points omega. Okay, so it's, it's a little bit like trigonometric functions. So for a trigonometric function, you can add multiples of 2 pi to the argument without affecting the value of the function. With these functions, you actually have two independent periods, which means that you can translate the argument by any point in a lattice, and you won't, you won't affect the value of the function. Okay, so that's the concept of a doubly periodic or elliptic function. So the general attack plan is as follows. If you give me a, a lattice over C, then I can take this quotient and I can form this complex torus, right? Using a certain elliptic function, which is naturally associated to your lattice, it turns out that you can parameterize a, an elliptic curve over C, okay? So this is, I'll use a function called the Weierstrass P function that was defined by Karl Weierstrass. And of course, historically, this came after Jacobi developed the whole theory using beta functions. Uh, theta functions are very interesting. Um, they come up in mathematical physics as well as in number theory. So in number theory, they have to do with quadratic forms, counting how many points in lattices have certain values, take, uh, take certain values under a quadratic form. So in other words, problems in number theory, like how many ways can we represent a given integer as the sum of this many squares, or things like that, that has to do with theta functions. But anyway, we'll take the Weierstrass approach here. So again, I have a lattice. Lambda is a lattice in C. Then I'm going to define Weierstrass P function as follows. So again, this depends on the lattice you pick at the beginning. But it's 1 over z squared plus the sum over all lattice points, omega and lambda, that are not 0, of 1 over z minus omega squared minus 1 over omega squared. All right, so for any z, which is not a lattice point, I define p of z by this series, of course, there's a dependence on lambda. And whenever z is a lattice point, I just define it to be infinity. So it's not clear from this, but what happens is that this function actually turns out to be an even elliptic function. Okay, it's not clear that it's elliptic, but you can see that if you just take its derivative, because when you differentiate it, these correction terms go away, and you get something that only involves a series like this. Okay, and then you can see that's I mean, just by looking at it, you can tell that it's elliptic, because if you replace z by z plus omega naught, then you'll see that uh, you can just re relabel things, and it'll be the exact same sum. So that's how you prove that the p this p function is actually elliptic. And let me tell you a differential equation that the p the, the p function satisfies. So this satisfies. The following differential equation. So if I take the derivative of the p function, then that's actually 
4 times the cube of the p function minus g2 times the p function minus g3. g3. So what are these g2 and g3? These are just complex constants that depend on the choice of lambda. Okay, so these are complex numbers which will change if you vary the lattice. And in fact, they change very nicely with respect to the lattice. In fact, they're what are called modular forms. So we'll, I'll get into that a bit later. Um, so this is the differential equation that the p-function satisfies. And you can, you can kind of tell where this is going now, because if you look at this, you're like, oh, that's an elliptic curve. I mean, it's right there, right? So what I can do is I can, I can use, now use the p-function to parameterize the elliptic curve whose equation is y squared equals 4x cubed minus g2x minus g3, okay? So let me show you how to do that now. So of course I'm being a bit, I'm kind of waving my hands a bit here. You should really check that this definition converges absolutely and so on, actually defines a meromorphic function, but I won't do that because it's in every textbook. Um, so you can check that yourself. So how does the parameterization work? Parameterization. So all I do is I am, I'm going to let x of t be p of t and y of t be p prime of t. Then you can, one can show that if I look at these points, x of t, y of t, and again, I'm, I'm being a bit uh, loose because what you should really do is look at the curve it traces out in the complex projective plane. I'm just doing the affine points here. Um, but the p-function has a pole of order 2 at all the lattice points, okay? Which means that as t goes towards 0, okay, so say my lattice looks like this. I've got 0 here, and there's omega 1 and omega 2, okay? And here's my fundamental parallelogram. What I'm going to do is I'm going to let t run through this fundamental parallelogram. And I should really exclude those edges, only take those two. And of course, I want to exclude that point too. So I really want to, these, these two lattice points are not actually in the fundamental parallelogram. So I just want to take this region, and then as t is any point in here, the p-function will take some finite value, okay, because its only poles are at the lattice points. And then as t starts going towards zero, these values x and t and y and t will blow up, okay? And so for that reason, this doesn't make total sense, right? Because I need the point infinity here somehow. But again, projective plane, the projective plane gives us the, uh, the justification for that, okay? So if I, if I do this, and I let t run through this... Uh, so I don't call this call this P. That's the fundamental parallelogram of my lattice lambda. This set, well, I should say the map from P to the, the projective plane is an elliptic curve. Okay, so this is an elliptic curve. Almost, remember, uh, kind of lying to you here because you need to do things projectively, but it's an elliptic curve with equation. y squared equals 4x cubed minus g2 of lambda x minus g3 of lambda. All right? So I haven't actually proven this, but it, one can show that, that the p-function does indeed do this, and it gives you a, a bijection between this fundamental parallelogram and this projective non-singular cubic elliptic curve. Okay? So... That was really the first thing I wanted to talk about. Now, let me just quickly compute the Laurent expansion of the p function for you uh, around zero. Okay, so uh, near z equals zero. So how do you do this? Well, again, we had p of z was z to the negative 2 plus the sum of z minus omega to the negative 2 plus omega to the negative 2. 
So that was the definition of P, and this was overall non-zero lattice points omega. Okay, so if I look at G of Z equals P of Z minus Z to the negative two, then it has no pole at zero, right? So I can actually write a Taylor expansion for G, and that means that the coefficients in the Laurent expansion of the virus rest P function will just be the nth derivatives of this function g evaluated zero over n factorial, okay? So if you do that, uh, what you get is that these are the functions that come up, okay? So I won't go through the actual process of differentiating, but the things that appear as the coefficients, all the, so there's only even powers of z that appear in this expansion. And uh, so k is definitely gonna be even here. But the numbers that come up are these, these series that you get from the lattice. So what do you do? You sum over all omega in your lattice, that are, that's not zero, of one over omega to the k. All right? So this thing is actually very interesting in its own right. It's called the Eisenstein series of weight k. And actually, these are modular forms, okay? So what I mean by that is if you let the lattice lambda vary, they transform uh, very nicely. So we'll get into that in a minute. So these are the Eisenstein series of weight k. And if k is odd, you can see this is zero, right? Because you'll just get cancellation in this sum. So k actually has to be even. And in fact, k needs to be at least four because when it's two, things go wrong and this doesn't converge properly doesn't converge absolutely, I should say. So, um, right. So these are, these are the coefficients in, the, in this expansion of the p-function. So now let me, let me explain what I mean by these things being modular forms. All right, so I've gone through Elliptic functions, now let me talk about the upper half plane. So I'm going to define H to be all the Z in C with positive imaginary part. All right, so exactly what you would expect when somebody says upper half plane. That's what I want to talk about. And uh, I want to talk about lattices. So what do points in the upper half plane have to do with lattices in C? So if I have a la lattice, so lambda and C lattice, then I write lambda is Z omega one plus Z omega two, okay? What I can do is I can rotate and dilate this lattice until one of its basis vectors is one, okay? So I need to make sure to do this properly because um, otherwise I'll get it in the lower half plane. I'll get the other one in the lower half plane instead. But what I can do is I can write this as uh, omega 1 times z plus omega z omega 2 over omega 1. So I can write it like this, right? So now what I've, what I've effectively done is reduce this to a lattice, one of whose basis vectors is 1, okay? And I'm going to assume, without loss of generality, that omega 2 over omega 1 is in the upper half plane. It's either in the upper half plane or it's in the lower half plane because I, ex because I said that these two guys are linearly independent over R, which means that when I take their ratio, it's not real, okay? So it can't be on the, on the, X, the real axis. So it's gotta be in one of the half planes and I'm just gonna assume that it's in the upper one, okay? So now I'm gonna introduce a group action of a certain discrete subgroup of the group, well, SL2R or GL2 plus R, okay? So what's, what are these groups that I'm talking about? So GL2, GL plus 2R, this is a set of two by two invertible matrices A, B, C, D, uh, such that these four entries, these are all real, and the determinant is positive. So AD minus BC is 
positive. Okay, so that's what GL plus 2R is, and it has a subgroup, SL2R, of those matrices A, B, C, D, where again these are all real, and uh, the determinant is 1. So A, B, C, D are real, and A, D mi minus B, C is equal to 1. All right, so these are Lie groups, and now I want to look at the a group action of a discrete subgroup of SL2R, namely SL2Z. So SL2Z, this is the same thing as this, but now I require these entries to be integers. Okay, so uh, A, B, C, D, or A, B, C, D are integers. And again, I want the determinant to be 1. So the motivation for looking at this particular subgroup is as follows. If I have a lattice uh, z plus z tau, and I know that that's equal to some other lattice z plus z tau naught, it's not true that tau is equal to tau naught, okay? But here's what is true. I can write tau naught as a tau plus b, and I can also write 1, okay, because so, so far all I'm using is that this, this, this uh, containment holds, right? Now, 1 can be expressed as C cal plus D, all right? Now, is it possible that the matrix A, B, C, D is, is uh, not invertible? Well, if you look at this, it's actually impossible, right? Because tau naught is in the upper half plane, and 1 is on the real axis, so they're, they're, linear, they're linearly independent. So, I mean, if this was a multiple of this, then you'd get a contradiction. If that's a multiple of that, you also get a contradiction. So I'll leave you to check that explicitly. But anyway, you can do this, and then using the fact that I also have the other containment here, I can also express tau as, I don't know, a prime tau naught plus b prime, and I can write 1 as c prime tau naught plus d prime, right? Now, since I have this, I can divide, I can divide the first equation by the second, right? So I can just put an equal sign here, put a and then divide. Okay, so this is true. So tau naught is actually this function of tau. And these are called Möbius transformations. So you study them in complex analysis. They're actually the, uh, the conformal auto biholomorphisms of the upper half plane, okay? Or rather of the, the Riemann sphere, actually. But we're only dealing with a special subset of them here. We're dealing with SL2Z, okay? So, so when I write these equations, of course, all of these coefficients are integers, which is why they're inter integral matrices, right? And then the fact that I have this actually implies that, uh, well, the matrices are invertible, so they have to have determinant plus or minus one, right? Because if you have an integer matrix, which has an inverse, and that's also an integer matrix, then they both have to have determinant plus or minus one. Um, okay. So motivated by that, what I do is I define an action, action of SL2Z on H. And this is just, this is really just a restriction of the action of GL2R plus on H, okay? And here's how it works. Uh, if, if gamma A, B, C, D is in SL2Z, then define gamma acting on a point tau of the upper half plane. Well, how do I do it? Well, I just say it's A tau plus B over C tau plus D. Okay, so you can actually check that the composition of these Möbius transformations corresponds exactly to multiplication of these matrices, A, B, C, D. And uh, all, the, all the properties of a group action are true. So this is actually a group action, right? So then, modular forms, one thing you might ask is, are there any nice functions on the upper half plane that are invariant with respect to this action? Okay, so in other words, uh, I could ask for this. F of gamma acting on tau, maybe I want that to be the same as F of tau for all tau in the upper half plane, right? So it turns out that if you allow your functions to be meromorphic, then such functions do actually exist. But a lot of the natural functions that arise uh, 
don't satisfy this. They satisfy something a little bit weaker. So you need to have some kind of transformation factor here. Okay? So let me define what a modular function is now. These are various, variously called modular forms, modular functions. Terminology is not really that consistent. Modular form is usually real, reserved for the case when it's actually holomorphic. So you don't have any poles on the upper half plane. Okay, so, uh, so a function f from the upper half plane into c, well I should really say c bar, this is called, and I guess I want to require it to be meromorphic, so a meromorphic function f from h to c bar is called weakly modular of weight k, It's weakly modular of weight k if, well, f of this matrix a, b, c, d acting on a point, any point tau of the upper half plane is equal to f of tau, but then times this factor of automorphy. So c, d, c tau plus d to the k. All right? So, so for the observation we make here is that this matrix 1, 1, 1, and with a 0 here, this is actually in SL2Z. So what transformation of the upper half plane does this describe? Well, if you look at the, if you remember the way we define the group action, 1, 1, 1, acting on tau, well, it should be tau plus 1 over, well, 0 tau plus 1. So it's just this. So the way this matrix in SL2Z acts on the upper half plane is merely by shifting it one unit to the, to the right, okay? So what, is, what then does this modularity condition get us? So in the case of that particular matrix, uh, we had C is zero and D is one, right? So this is actually just one, this, this extra factor here. So special case, if f is weakly modular, then what do we get? We get that f of tau plus 1 is equal to f of tau. All right, so it's actually periodic. You've got this function defined on the upper half plane, but if you know its value in a strip, a vertical strip of, strip of width 1, you know its value on the whole upper half plane, right? So it's periodic, and uh, what can we do with that? Well, what I want to do is define define q, so this is another, I'm going to define another coordinate, q, and how do we do it? We say that it's e to the 2 pi i tau. All right, so if you think about the geometry of, so the dependence of q on tau, let's just, let's just say tau is x plus i y, well, what does this give us? This gives us e to the negative 2 pi y, e to the 2 pi i x, right? Okay. Well, this is just some, some positive real number, right? And this guy, where's that? That's on the unit circle, right? So actually, if you take your point tau in the upper half plane and you just start letting it move up, up to infinity, then of course this y is getting really, really big, so this, this factor out front here will be really small. So you think about it for a little bit, what you see is that this mapping tau goes to q is actually mapping the upper half plane uh, it's a covering transformation from the upper half plane onto the punctured open unit disk in C. Okay, so let me let me draw a picture. So here's the upper half plane. Okay, and here's your point tau here. Okay, there's tau, and then we have this this transformation. And what does it do? Well, it sends tau over to e to the 2 pi i tau. Okay. And this thing is going to be living in this open unit disk. Okay, but punctured, punctured at the origin. Because, of course, uh, as I said before, e to the negative 2 pi i, or 2 pi y, that's always positive. So you can never actually get to the origin. You keep 
you keep moving tau higher and higher, but it will just approach the origin, never actually get there. Okay? And similarly, you can never actually get on the boundary of a circle because you would need y equals zero to do that, right? But we're looking at, we're assuming that the imaginary part of tau is positive, okay? So you look at this transformation. Now, one thing you, one natural thing to expect is uh, I have a function defined on this, on this object here, okay? So my weekly modular function f was defined on h, and it goes into c bar. But now I have this transformation. So because it's periodic, it doesn't matter. So if I, if I pick a point q in here, right, it doesn't matter which preimage of q I choose in the upper half plane. Okay, so there's lots of them. Uh, if tau maps to q here, then of course tau plus 1, tau plus 2, and so on, those will all be mapping to q, and in the other direction too. But it doesn't matter which one of them I pick. So I can pick any of them, and then define f squiggle from this open punctured disk, so I'll just write it as, I don't know, d without zero. I define f squiggle from this punctured open disk into c bar. And how do I do that? Well, I just say, okay, well, f squiggle of q is f of tau, where tau is, you know, q is equal to e to the 2 pi i tau. It's just some choice of tau that makes that work, okay? It doesn't matter which one you pick. So I define f squiggle like this. Now I have a function that's on the punctured open unit ball, okay? And what, one thing I can ask is, well, I want this to extend to a, I want this to extend to a meromorphic function defined on the whole open unit disk, okay? And that's, that's the definition of a modular form. Okay, so I define weak modularity, but now I'm gonna say that my function f So now f, f is a modular function if it's weakly modular and extends to a meromorphic function Uh, on this punctured disk. Okay. So actually for modular forms, what you want is that f is not only meromorphic, but it's holomorphic. Okay, so f has to be holomorphic in the upper half plane, and then it has to extend to a holomorphic function on this punctured open disk. So in other words, you need to give it a value, it needs to be approaching some kind of limit at infinity. So as tau goes, as tau moves to infinity, there's a, a value there, okay? And we call, we call f a cusp form, so if, so f, f is a modular form if, again, it's holomorphic on the upper half plane and it extends to a holomorphic function on this punctured disk. And um, f is a cusp form if, well, when you, of course, when you look at the expansion, so one thing I should have mentioned is f squiggle, this function, it's, it's defined on a punctured open disk, right? So I can write down a Fourier expansion of it. So f squiggle of q, or rather a Laurent expansion. So I can write sum over all n and z of a n uh, q to the n. I can write this, right? But now I said that it needs to be meromorphic. So what I, I, don't, I can't have infinitely many negative degree terms here. It has to just be n greater than or equal to minus n. But of course, now I'm working with modular forms. So this n has to be going from 0 to infinity, right? Now, a0 is the value at infinity, right? It's the limiting value as tau goes higher and higher. But for a cusp form, we actually want there to be no constant term. So in other words, it vanishes at infinity, at the cusp. So if this is true, okay, the Laurent expansion of f squiggle gives you a Fourier expansion of f, right? Because f of tau, I can now say this is the sum from n equals 1 to infinity, a n e to the 2 pi i tau n, because q is e to the 2 pi i tau, right? So what I want is that the constant, the constant term of this thing, uh, this Fourier expansion, is, is 0. So it vanishes at infinity. 
So modular forms with respect to SL2Z, those things actually form a graded algebra, okay, a graded complex algebra. And the conditions, so the modularity condition, is actually so stringent that it causes these vector spaces to be finite dimensional, okay? So you get a graded, you get a graded complex algebra where each of the, the, the grades, so in other words, if I look at the space of modular forms of weight k for some fixed integer k, of course k needs to be even because there are no odd, there are no odd modular forms as you can easily check. Um, but the space of modular forms for a given weight is always finite dimensional. And there are formulas that tell you what the dimensions are, okay? And actually, the cusp forms, if you look at the cusp forms, they form a graded ideal in that, that graded algebra, okay? 